Chapter Two, Part Two of The Chimney Corner by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in February 2020. Chapter Two, Part Two of a Woman's Sphere. In Primus this girl is rather delicate and genteel looking and you may know from the arrangement of her hair just what the last mode is of disposing of rats or waterfalls she has a lace bonnet with roses a silk mantilla a silk dress trimmed with velvet a white skirt with sixteen tucks and an embroidered edge a pair of cloth gaiters underneath which are a pair of stockings without feet the only pair in her possession she has no underlinen and sleeps at night in the working clothes she wears in the day she never seems to have in her outfit either comb brush or toothbrush of her own neither needles thread scissors nor pins her money when she has any being spent on more important articles such as the lace bonnet or silk mantilla or the rats and waterfalls that glorify her head when she wishes to sew she borrows what is needful of a convenient next neighbor and if she gets a place in a family as second girl she expects to subsist in these respects by borrowing of the better appointed servants or helping herself from the family stores she expects of course the very highest wages if she condescends to live out and by help of a trim outside appearance and the many vacancies that are continually occurring in households she gets places where her object is to do just as little of any duty assigned to her as possible to hurry through her performances put on her fine clothes and go a-gadding she is on free and easy terms with all the men she meets and ready at jests and repartee sometimes far from seemly her time of service in any one place lasts indifferently from a fortnight to two or three months when she takes her wages buys her a new parasol in the latest style and goes back to the intelligence office in the different families where she has lived she has been told a hundred times the proprieties of household life how to make beds arrange rooms wash china glass and silver and set tables but her habitual rule is to try in each place how small and how poor services will be accepted when she finds less will not do she gives more when the mistress follows her constantly and shows an energetic determination to be well served she shows that she can serve well but the moment such attention relaxes she slides back again she is as destructive to the house as a fire the very spirit of wastefulness is in her she cracks the china dents the silver stops the water pipes with rubbish and after she is gone there is generally a sum equal to half her wages to be expended in repairing the effects of her carelessness and yet there is one thing to be said for her she is quite as careful of her employer's things as of her own the full amount of her mischiefs often does not appear at once as she is glib of tongue adroit in apologies and lies with as much alertness and as little thought of conscience as a blackbird chatters it is difficult for people who have been trained from childhood in the school of verities who have been lectured for even the shadow of a prevarication and shut up in disgrace for a lie till truth becomes a habit of their souls it is very difficult for people so educated to understand how to get on with those who never speak the truth except by mere accident who assert any and everything that comes into their heads with all the assurance and all the energy of perfect verity what becomes of this girl she finds means by begging borrowing living out or keeping herself extremely trim and airy for a certain length of time till the rats and waterfalls the lace hat and parasol and the glib tongue have done their work in making a fool of some honest young mechanic who earns three dollars a day she marries him with no higher object than to have somebody to earn money for her to spend and what comes of such marriages that is one ending of her career the other is on the street in haunts of vice in prison in drunkenness and death whence come these girls 
they are as numerous as yellow butterflies in autumn they flutter up to cities from the country they grow up from mothers who ran the same sort of career before them and the reason why in the end they fall out of all reputable employment and starve on poor wages is that they become physically mentally and morally incapable of rendering any service which society will think worth paying for i remember said i that the head of the most celebrated dressmaking establishment in new york in reply to the appeals of the needlewomen of the city for sympathy and wages came out with published statements to this effect that the difficulty lay not in unwillingness of employers to pay what work was worth but in finding any work worth paying for that she had many applicants but among them few who could be of real use to her that she in common with everybody in this country who had any kind of serious responsibilities to carry was continually embarrassed for want of skilled work people who could take and go on with the labor of her various departments without her constant supervision that out of a hundred girls there would not be more than five to whom she could give a dress to be made and dismiss it from her mind as something certain to be properly done let people individually look around their own little sphere and ask themselves if they know any woman really excelling in any valuable calling or accomplishment who is suffering for want of work all of us know seamstresses dressmakers nurses and laundresses who have made themselves such a reputation and are so beset and overcrowded with work that the whole neighborhood is constantly on its knees to them with uplifted hands the fine seamstress who can cut and make trousseaus and layettes in elegant perfection is always engaged six months in advance the pet dressmaker of the neighborhood must be engaged in may for september and in september for may a laundress who sends your clothes home in nice order always has all the work she can do good work in any department is the rarest possible thing in our american life and it is a fact that the great majority of workers both in the family and out, do only tolerably well, not so badly that it actually cannot be borne, yet not so well as to be a source of real thorough satisfaction. The exceptional worker in every neighborhood, who does things really well, can always set her own price, and is always having more offering than she can possibly do. The trouble, then, in finding employment for women lies deeper than the purses or consciences of the employers. It lies in the want of education in women. The want of education, I say, meaning by education that which fits a woman for practical and profitable employment in life, and not mere common school learning. Yes, said my wife, for it is a fact that the most troublesome and hopeless persons to provide for are often those who have had good medium education but no feminine habits no industry no practical calculation no muscular strength and no knowledge of any one of women's peculiar duties in the earlier days of new england women as a class had far fewer opportunities for acquiring learning yet were far better educated physically and morally than now the high school did not exist at the common school they learned reading writing and arithmetic and practised spelling while at home they did the work of the household they were cheerful bright active ever on the alert able to do anything from the harnessing and driving of a horse to the finest embroidery the daughters of new england in those days looked the world in the face without a fear they shunned no labor they were afraid of none and they could always find their way to a living but although less instructed in school learning said i they showed no deficiency in intellectual acumen i see no such women nowadays as some i remember of that olden time women whose strong minds and ever active industry carried on reading and study side by side with household toils i remember a young lady friend of mine attending a celebrated boarding school boarded in the family of a woman who had never been to school longer than was necessary to learn to read and write yet who was a perfect cyclopedia of general information the young scholar used to take her chemistry and natural philosophy into the kitchen where her friend was busy with her household work and read her lessons to her that she might have the benefit of her explanations and so while the good lady scoured her andirons or kneaded her bread she lectured to her protege on mysteries of science far beyond the limits of the textbook many of the graduates of our modern high schools would find it hard to shine in conversation 
on the subjects they had studied in the searching presence of some of these vigorous matrons of the olden time whose only school had been the leisure hours gained by energy and method from their family cares and in those days said my wife there lived in our families a class of american domestics women of good sense and good powers of reflection who applied this sense and power of reflection to household matters in the early part of my married life i myself had american help and they were not only excellent servants but trusty and invaluable friends but now all this class of applicants for domestic service have disappeared i scarce know why or how all i know is there is no more a betsy or a lois such as used to take domestic cares off my shoulders so completely good heavens where are they cried bob where do they hide i would search through the world after such a prodigy the fact is said i there has been a slow and gradual reaction against household labor in america mothers began to feel that it was a sort of curse to be spared if possible to their daughters women began to feel that they were fortunate in proportion as they were able to be entirely clear of family responsibilities then irish labor began to come in simultaneously with a great advance in female education for a long while nothing was talked of written of thought of in teachers meetings conventions and assemblies but the neglected state of female education and the whole circle of the arts and sciences was suddenly introduced into our free school system from which needlework as gradually and quietly was suffered to drop out the girl who attended the primary and high school had so much study imposed on her that she had no time for sewing or housework and the delighted mother was only too happy to darn her stockings and do the housework alone that her daughter might rise to a higher plane than she herself had attained to the daughter thus educated had on coming to womanhood no solidity of muscle no manual dexterity no practice or experience in domestic life and if she were to seek a livelihood there remained only teaching or some feminine trade or the factory these factories said my wife have been the ruin of hundreds and hundreds of our once healthy farmers daughters and others from the country they go there young and unprotected they live there in great boarding-houses and associate with a promiscuous crowd without even such restraints of maternal supervision as they would have in great boarding-schools their bodies are enfeebled by labor often necessarily carried on in a foul and heated atmosphere and at the hours when off duty they are exposed to all the dangers of unwatched intimacy with the other sex moreover the factory girl learns and practices but one thing some one mechanical movement which gives no scope for invention ingenuity or any other of the powers called into play by domestic labor so that she is in reality unfitted in every way for family duties many times it has been my lot to try in my family service girls who have left factories and i have found them wholly useless for any of the things which a woman ought to be good for they knew nothing of a house or what ought to be done in it they had imbibed a thorough contempt of household labor and looked upon it but as a dernier resort last resort and it was only the very lightest of its tasks that they could even begin to think of i remember i tried to persuade one of these girls the pretty daughter of a fisherman to take some lessons in washing and ironing she was at that time engaged to be married to a young mechanic who earned something like two or three dollars a day my child said i you will need to understand all kinds of housework if you're going to be married she tossed her little head indeed she wasn't going to trouble herself about that but who will get up your husband's shirts oh he must put them out i'm not going to be married to make a slave of myself another young factory girl who came for table and parlor work was so full of airs and fine notions that it seemed as difficult to treat with her as with a princess she could not sweep because it blistered her hands which in fact were long and delicate she could not think of putting them in hot dish water and for that reason preferred washing the dishes in cold water she required a full hour in the morning to make her toilet she was laced so tightly that she could not stoop without vertigo and her hoops were of dimensions which seemed to render it impossible for her to wait upon table 
she was quite exhausted with the effort of ironing the table napkins and chamber towels yet she could not think of living out under two dollars a week both these girls had had a good free school education and could read any amount of novels write a tolerable letter but had not learned anything with sufficient accuracy to fit them for teachers they were pretty and their destiny was to marry and lie a dead weight on the hands of some honest man and to increase in their children the number of incapables well said bob what would you have what is to be done in the first place said i i would have it felt by those who are seeking to elevate women that the work is to be done not so much by creating for her new spheres of action as by elevating her conceptions of that domestic vocation to which god and nature have assigned her it is all very well to open to her avenues of profit and advancement in the great outer world but after all to make and keep a home is and ever must be a woman's first glory her highest aim no work of art can compare with a perfect home the training and guiding of a family must be recognized as the highest work a woman can perform and female education ought to be conducted with special reference to this men are trained to be lawyers to be physicians to be mechanics by long and self-denying study and practice a man cannot even make shoes merely by going to the high school and learning reading writing and mathematics he cannot be a bookkeeper or a printer simply from general education now women have a sphere and profession of their own a profession for which they are fitted by physical organization by their own instincts and to which they are directed by the pointing and the manifest finger of god and that sphere is family life duties to the state and to public life they may have but the public duties of women must bear to their family ones the same relation that the family duties of men bear to their public ones the defect in the late efforts to push on female education is that it has been for her merely general and that it has left out and excluded all that is professional and she undertakes the essential duties of womanhood when they do devolve on her without any adequate preparation but is it possible for a girl to learn at school the things which fit her for family life said bob why not i replied once it was thought impossible in schools to teach girls geometry or algebra or the higher mathematics it was thought impossible to put them through collegiate courses but it has been done and we see it women study treatises on political economy in schools and why should not the study of domestic economy form a part of every school course a young girl will stand up at the blackboard and draw and explain the compound blowpipe and describe all the process of making oxygen and hydrogen why should she not draw and explain a refrigerator as well as an air pump both are to be explained on philosophical principles when a schoolgirl in her chemistry studies the reciprocal action of acids and alkalis what is there to hinder the teaching her its application to the various processes of cooking where acids and alkalis are employed why should she not be led to see how effervescence and fermentation can be made to perform their office in the preparation of light and digestible bread why should she not be taught the chemical substances by which food is often adulterated and the tests by which such adulterations are detected why should she not understand the processes of confectionery and know how to guard against the deleterious or poisonous elements that are introduced into children's sugar plums and candies why when she learns the doctrine of mordants the substances by which different colors are set should she not learn it with some practical view to future life so that she may know how to set the color of a fading calico or restore the color of a spotted one why in short when a girl has labored through a profound chemical work and listened to courses of chemical lectures should she come to domestic life which presents a constant series of chemical experiments and changes and go blindly along as without chart or compass unable to tell what will take out a stain or what will brighten a metal what are common poisons and what their antidotes and not knowing enough of the laws of caloric to understand how to warm a house or the laws of atmosphere to know how to ventilate one why should the preparation of food that subtle art on which life health 
cheerfulness good temper and good looks so largely depend forever be left in the hands of the illiterate and the vulgar a benevolent gentleman has lately left a large fortune for the founding of a university for women and the object is stated to be to give women who have already acquired a general education the means of acquiring a professional one to fit themselves for some employment by which they may gain a livelihood in this institution the women are to be instructed in bookkeeping stenography telegraphing photographing drawing modeling and various other arts but so far as i remember there is no proposal to teach domestic economy as at least one of women's professions why should there not be a professor of domestic economy in every large female school why should not this professor give lectures first on house planning and building illustrated by appropriate apparatus why should not the pupils have presented to their inspection models of houses planned with reference to economy to ease of domestic service to warmth to ventilation and to architectural appearance why should not the professor go on to lecture further on house fixtures with models of the best mangles washing machines clothes ringers ranges furnaces and cooking stoves together with drawings and apparatus illustrative of domestic hydraulics showing the best contrivances for bathing rooms and the obvious principles of plumbing so that the pupils may have some idea how to work the machinery of a convenient house when they have it and to have such conveniences introduced when wanting if it is thought worth while to provide at great expense apparatus for teaching the revolutions of saturn's moons and the procession of the equinoxes why should there not be some also to teach what it may greatly concern a woman's earthly happiness to know why should not the professor lecture on home chemistry devoting his first lecture to bread baking and why might not a batch of bread be made and baked and exhibited to the class together with specimens of morbid anatomy in the bread line the sour cotton bread of the baker the rough big hold bread the heavy fossil bread the bitter bread of too much yeast and the causes of their defects pointed out and so with regard to the various articles of food why might not chemical lectures be given on all of them one after another in short it would be easy to trace out a course of lectures on common things to occupy a whole year and for which the pupils whenever they come to have homes of their own will thank the lecturer to the last day of their life then there is no impossibility of teaching needlework the cutting and fitting of dresses in female schools the thing is done very perfectly in english schools for the working classes a girl trained at one of these schools came into a family i once knew she brought with her a sewing book in which the process of making various articles was exhibited in miniature the several parts of a shirt were first shown each perfectly made and fastened to a leaf of the book by itself and then the successive steps of uniting the parts till finally appeared a miniature model of the whole the sewing was done with red thread so that every stitch might show and any imperfection be at once remedied the same process was pursued with regard to other garments and a good general idea of cutting and fitting them was thus given to an entire class of girls in the same manner the care and nursing of young children and the tending of the sick might be made the subject of lectures every woman ought to have some general principles to guide her with regard to what is to be done in case of the various accidents that may befall either children or grown people and of the lesser illnesses and ought to know how to prepare comforts and nourishment for the sick hawthorne's satirical remarks upon the contrast between the elegant zenobia's conversation and the smoky porridge she made for him when he was an invalid might apply to the volunteer cookery of many charming women i think said bob that your professor of domestic economy would find enough to occupy his pupils in fact said i were domestic economy properly honored and properly taught in the manner described it would open a sphere of employment to so many women in the home life that we should not be obliged to send our women out to california or the pacific to put an end to an anxious and aimless life when domestic work is sufficiently honored to be taught as an art and science in our boarding schools and high schools 
then possibly it may acquire also dignity in the eyes of our working classes and young girls who have to earn their own living may no longer feel degraded in engaging in domestic service the place of a domestic in a family may become as respectable in their eyes as a place in the factory in the printing office in the dressmaking or millinery establishment or behind the counter of a shop in america there is no class which will confess itself the lower class and a thing recommended solely for the benefit of any such class finds no one to receive it if the intelligent and cultivated look down on household work with disdain if they consider it as degrading a thing to be shunned by every possible device they may depend upon it that the influence of such contempt of women's noble duties will flow downward producing a like contempt in every class of life our sovereign princesses learn the doctrine of equality very quickly and are not going to sacrifice themselves to what is not considered de bon ton by the upper classes and the girl with the laced hat and parasol without underclothes who does her best to shirk her duties as housemaid and is looking for marriage as an escape from work is a fair copy of her mistress who married for much the same reason who hates housekeeping and would rather board or do anything else than have the care of a family the one is about as respectable as the other when housekeeping becomes an enthusiasm and its study and practice of fashion then we shall have in america that class of persons to rely on for help in household labors who are now going to factories to printing offices to every kind of toil forgetful of the best life and sphere of women end of chapter two woman's sphere